there's handouts there which you need to circulate. So there's three handouts. Yeah. And um, the one you need for now is just one page. There's one which is double-sided for the end. There's one which is eight pages yeah. and one with one page. So the one with one page is what you need. So we start with uh, choosing topics? That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the 34 categories of videos, which you see there. So it's um, the the handout you want is called handout for ah oh, where is it called? Let me just make sure. Handout handout for PT one of workshop. Part, part one yes part okay one. that's it good. So I'm going to talk about the 34 categories in that table, uh, the figure one, and their video techniques and teaching functions. And um, I'm going to illustrate these techniques with a few video clips. Um, but a few words first. I've divided them, as you see, in four. And there's four domains. Domain one, the cognitive domain. So that's distinctive techniques uh, for which video can help learning. So that's domain number one. So it's the cognitive domain. Domain two, experiential. Video can supply experiences. Now, they're second-hand experiences, not face-to-face -face experiences, but they can be very realistic. Domain three, effective teaching functions, where the learner may derive some determination to get up and do something. It's a motivational. Or the learner's feelings may change, or their attitudes may change. For example, they may become less racist, Oh, hopefully. <laughs> so domain four is demonstrating skills and that one could be done by an expert but also by a peer. And there's six or oh, seven different categories there. I said six, there's seven. Now those techniques and teaching functions they can add substantial value to any multiple media educational uh, course um, because they exploit video strengths which other media do not possess. Um, let me qu quickly say something about a few of those 34 before we see some examples. Um, domain one, distinctive ways to assist learning, the cognition domain. So 1.1, composite pictures. For example, you can have a split screen and this can aid discrimination, comparing things. 1.2, animation. Um, in order to show dynamic processes. 1.3, visual metaphor, analogy or representation. Um, that would help students understand abstract processes. 1.4, illustrating abstract concepts with real world examples. Therefore, making those concepts more tangible. Um, now, note there there's an overlap with category two the presentation of real world examples that would entail experiential categories uh, such as 2.6 people and animals interacting for example or 2.8 uh, resource material or 2.9 one-off or rare events um, but category 2 is what we show whereas 1.4 is why we show it it's a teaching function. Okay, so going on to category two now, 2.1, movement. So this is the fundamental reason for using video, showing movement. And notice that advice for synchronous location sound. That's essential for realism. You have synchronous location sound, so you can hear the things you're looking at. 2.2. 
showing viewpoints, uh, for example, aerial viewpoints, undersea, microscopy, extreme close-ups. Now, extreme close-up is not like microscopy, but it's a very close shot. So zoomed in that the view is impossible in real life because you couldn't focus your eyes. So that's what we mean by extreme close-up. And so on, down to item eight, staged events. For example, dramatized enactments or complex experiments. Then uh, item three, nurturing effective characteristics. Motivations, feelings. For example, 3.3, stimulate the appetite to learn. For example, you could reveal the fascina fascination of the subject. Uh, three point, let's look at 3.6, for example. Reassure, encourage self-efficacy. If you make people feel that they are capable, then you enhance the readiness to learn. And so on down to number uh, eight. Create sense of importance. Um, and finally, number four, seven very large categories there. For example, uh, number four of box four, in interpersonal skills. Um, that includes teaching. That's an enormous subject by itself. <coughs> now, um, why are these 34 categories pedagogically potent, as I claim, in the title? Um, and the reason is they add value to your program because of videos rich presentational skills and I've listed those below the for the figure one. <coughs> so we have for example videos move, moving images with synchronous narration, real time or slow motion, real life or diagrammatic and so on. All those presentational attributes which video has and other media do not have. Now in most circumstances for most of these 34 categories in the boxes, these presentational attributes make video um, a better medium and more effective than other media. In fact, there are some categories which make it unique, uh, which are impossible in other ways. For example, fast motion, 2.5. Say so you could use time lapse to speed up a process thousands of times. Um, <clears throat> like the tidal cycle over 12 hours or 24 hours. Now I'm going to illustrate those 34 categories with 21 clips and the duration is not very long, it's 17 minutes but I'll be talking about it as well and there are subjects like statistics, um, metal casting, psychology, engineering, um, also medicine actually medicine because the first one is about medicine. Um, so before I carry on, any questions so far? No problems? <clears throat> I should say something which quite often is misunderstood. Um, box number three, nurturing effective characteristics. These are supposed to be long-lasting effects. So I'm not talking about video just being a motivational medium which makes people learn from the medium. I'm talking about um, nurturing something which will last a long time. So, <coughs> okay, so now let me play the first um, extract. This sequence is one and a quarter minutes and it intersperses real life with animation um, to explain the standard technique for measuring um, blood pressure. So it's 1.2 animated diagrams. Whilst the cuff pressure is between the highest and lowest pressures in the artery, blood will only squeeze past for part of the time, and the intermittent flow creates a distinctive sound. As soon as the cuff pressure drops below the lowest arterial pressure, blood flow will become continuous and the sound becomes muffled and then quickly disappears altogether.
This point is noted as the lowest pressure. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, so. Yes. And so that animation is an artist impression of what happens inside a patient's arm when this is going on. Now, of course, this was interspersed with the real life. And this is particularly effective because each one gives strength to the other one. The real life gives the context and the animation gives the details of the invisible things happening inside the arm. So that's one item. Next one I'm going to show is three quarters of a minute. Um, this shows a succession of patients who are um, in different situations and they're all having their blood pressure measured. And this is going to illustrate 1.6 juxtaposition of contrasting situations. <coughs> We know that in any measurement situation, there are usually many possible causes of error or variation in the results obtained. Let's identify some of these in our blood pressure examples. One subject was very obviously pregnant. One patient was much older and in hospital, presumably ill. And the hospital ward will probably be much warmer than the university lab, which is obviously much busier than an examination room. Finally, the subjects all varied in age or sex. Okay, so 1.6 juxtaposition. That rapid juxtaposition of the four different situations, all in 45 seconds, is impossible to achieve in real life, of course. So it, con it contracts a lengthy experience down to within the viewers, um, the viewers' concentration span, their attention span, just 45 seconds. Of course, they have to experience it for real afterwards, these um, medical trainees, but this is a good introduction. So that's 1.6. Uh, next, um, it's a 20 seconds, the next one. Two doctors treat a patient. One is reassuring and the other is a bit frightening. Okay, so that's... Uh, demonstrating 4.4 um, demonstration of interpersonal skill. As we all know, blood pressure is very sensitive to stress levels and a patient needing to have their blood pressure measured will normally be a little anxious. So the observer's approach can make a world of difference to this anxiety. And I'd really just like to check it again this morning if that's okay. Roll your sleeve up and put your arm on the edge of the desk please. Okay, so that second one was not very friendly. Sorry, which number was? 4.4, uh, demonstration 4 .4. interpersonal skills. <clears throat> so the, that illustrates the technique whereby um, an expert demonstrates a social skill. And it is very true, this stress level. Yes. You know, I had some time ago, I was going to, they told me I had to have an injection in my eye. And then they took my blood pressure and it was two, it was 200. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not so, so bad because they give you drops and uh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> but <laughs> you, the thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, now the fourth one. This one is um, one and a half minutes and this is uh, statistics and it's two contestants they're playing darts um, this is um, I'm not showing the introduction which explains something so I'll explain it um, the blue set of darts is biased it drifts to the right and there's a red set of darts which is not biased it's well balanced and there are two contestants aiming for the center one of them is very good and the other one is a bad player. Okay, so this is going to illustrate 1.4 illustration and 2.10 staged events. The poor player throws the bias darts. And now the balance darts. The 
good player throws the bias darts. And now the balance darts. <laughs> we have four results. Biased, with a lot of variability. That is, systematic error, with a lot of random error. Unbiased, with a lot of variability. No systematic error, but a lot of random error. Biased, with little variability. Systematic error with low random error. And unbiased with little variability. No systematic error and low random error. Okay, so that, as I say, was 1.4 illustration. The concepts of random and systematic error um, are clarified by showing that real life example. But it's also an example of 2.10, a staged event. This is a very staged event. Um, and in a live lecture, you, you wouldn't be able to uh, c copy this yeah. because it would take, in fact, it took lots of time and lots of different takes in order to achieve this. Um, and uh, of course, both players were actually good players. They weren't bad. There wasn't one bad player. They contrived to throw the darts where they did. <laughs> in fact, you know, a biased set of darts which drifts to the right is actually impossible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's another one that's contrived. And even if it was possible, the players would compensate for it. <laughs> so there's a lot of staging inv involved in this. Okay, next one. Um, this one's three quarters of a minute, and this is um, going to illustrate lots of different things. Uh, 1.2 animation, 2.1 movement, 2.4 three dimensions, 2.7 chronological sequence. This is showing some steel which is heated up to a certain uh, level, with, and within a narrow range it's neither liquid nor solid. Not steel but it has been heated to the semi-solid state. It's self-supporting, but watch what happens when it's subjected to shear stress. It flows with the consistency of butter. In other words, it's highly thixotropic. Had this been tool steel, apart from being many hundred degrees hotter, the effect would have been the same, thixotropy. It's this property which is the key to thixer forming. Right, so, um, obviously animation was, oh sorry, I cut out the animation, there was an animation at the end, uh, so forget about that. 2.1, movement. Um, clearly to appreciate that semi-solid consistency you need to see the movement of the cutting of the, the metal. It's, you just need to see it distorted, sliced and pushed and so on. Now three dimensions. Of course the screen is two dimensions. So why does video give you three dimensions? Well, because you've got movement, you've got <coughs> very good lighting to show you can see the shadows, um, there's s sparkling going on. In order to show three dimensions First of all, you've got to have good lighting, showing the shadows, and you've also got to move the object or the camera. If you don't move either of them, the three dimensions won't happen. So, now the other one which is uh, di more difficult is 2.7, chronological sequence and pacing. It's not the same as movement. Um, you could probably show the slicing in a sequence of still photographs. Um, but the pacing, how long it takes for the thing to drop, what the pausing between cutting one bit and cutting another bit, and how long it takes for the metal to, 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 to go down, that can be captured by a video. We'll see some more examples of that chronological um, sequence in the next one. 
Sorry, I'm going fast because there's 21 to show. The next one is one minute. And um, this is going to illustrate 1.1 composite pictures and also again 2.7 chronological sequence. And um, you'll see an adult and a child in the scene. The adult is a scientist who's studying the speech development of the child. And um, she has told a story to the child. The child now has to repeat the story. But um, she's used a picture book to show this story to the child and she lets the child see the picture book because she's not investigating the memory of the child, just the speech development. So the split screen allows us to see the child and the pictures at the same time. Um, and then the chronological sequence and pacing. There's three different kinds going on here. Um, first of all, you see the speed of the speech delivery. Um, the duration of the pauses while the child is speaking. And then you see the sequence of speaking while the adult points to the pictures. So that's the chronological sequence in which things happen. Okay, that she was uh, she was not even for this child, but I think she is one of the lecturer's uh, children. So. <laughs> Maybe quite clever. Um, so, fifty-second um, one coming next. It's going to illustrate um, two point four three dimensions. You've seen a bit of it. An engineer is describing a type of borehole drilling and it has a tearing action in the rock. Three wings, stepped, tungsten carbide face and this bit is used in the softer formations for actually ripping the rock or tearing the rock um, from the ground. When it's down the borehole on the end of our drill collars it's used in this position. As it's rotated we have a hole down in the top here in which the flush, be it air or water, it is forced down the centre of this bit, comes out of these holes at the bottom and blasts against the cutting faces, keeping them clean. The cut material then is pushed up the side of the drill collars and up to the top of the hole. So this three dimension, um, illustrating three dimension, 2.4, you see what I meant now by movement of the object. I mean, you've got to get your your demonstrator to move the object when you're doing this uh, and it's it's not easy uh, you need to you can only do that by looking at the camera and saying no that's too fast or oh, don't move it so far away because I've lost the, the close-up so it's quite a difficult thing to do um, and normally people move things too fast for this but um, that person was trained to do it well um, for some reason or other, I've got another example of a borehole drilling. Can't remember why. Anyway, so another one coming, which is 2.1 movement, um, and again 2.4 um, three dimensions. As the bit is rotated at the bottom of the borehole, you can see these wheels rotate and crush the rock. The flush again is pushed down the centre of the bit, comes out at the bottom here and blasts away at the rollers, moving the cut material around the outside of the bit and up the borehole to the top. 
So uh, that last bit where he said moves to the outside of the bit, um, it could have been done better because it's upside down. He said it moves down there, but it actually moves up <laughs> because he turned it upside down. Anyway, um, it's, um, so we see the rotation of the wheels there. So that's just a little bit different than last time. Um, and to see those uh, wheels against the ground is the only way to appreciate how that's going to crush the rock. So that's the movement. And then the three dimensions, again, the movement, it's not just the movement of the object, it's also the fact that the demonstrator's hand is also in it. So that's what makes you feel the three dimensions, because you relate the position of the object to the position of the presenter's hand as well. So if you had just an object there on a turntable going around by itself without any hand there, it wouldn't be so three-dimensional. But if you had a hand there, it would be more if they was touching it. OK, so next uh, something. Um, ah, so this is, next one is an animation which is not exactly requiring movement, but just step-by-step build-up of a diagram. So that's 1.2 animated diagram. It's 30 seconds. Oh, sorry. This is the example I was showing you before, sorry. So it's three dimensions, this one. And this is what I mean by there's no person's hand in there. Still, you see the three dimensions quite well. One of the reasons is the lighting is very good. And as it goes round, you see the shadows. Um, I forgot that I had another one with three dimensions. If someone's hand was in there, it would be even better. Of course, the hand would have shadows as well. Now, this is the next one, which is um, 30 seconds, an animated diagram. First, the hand-sorted copper ore concentrate, together with charcoal and flux, was loaded into the furnace for smelting. Air blasts from bellows brought the temperature up to melting point, and bits of the furnace lining would get mixed into the melt. After several hours, the slag, if liquid enough, was tapped or run out of a hole in the side of the furnace, and the liquid copper was run off into a prepared space in front of the furnace. Well, I said that was just a build-up and there was no movement, but you did see movement, of course, and that was when each thing came on, it, it, it actually tromboned, as we, as we say. Um, now, that's an important point, because if a new thing comes onto the screen in a diagram, um, quite often, um, how do you know the viewer is looking at that point in the diagram? If it comes to the top left, they might miss it. So if there this needs to be something to show that this new thing has come on, and if it moves, the eye will immediately go there. Or it could flash brighter. That's another, another way of doing it. Um, OK, so that's an animated diagram. Now, something we haven't seen before is a short 17 seconds, 1.8 condensing time. 1.8, right. So this is part of the process of making a Bronze Age axe. Um, which was the same, the same uh, video as the last one you saw, but now we see a man actually doing something. And um, he's making a mould by covering an existing axe with some sand. Facing sand, consisting of used sand with 20% new Mansfield red sand milled in with it, is sieved over the pattern until it is completely covered. So, why is that condensing time? Well, the shot of the man's face was inserted in there. When we went back to see the, uh, opera, the procedure, it was actually 30 seconds later. So we condensed time by editing out. Um, but you can't just jump. It would look strange. So there was instead a cutaway of the person's face, which is relevant because you want to see the concentration on their face. 
what they're doing. So that's called a cutaway. Um, probably the duration was about double that, that duration. Um, now, next one is, um, is going to show expanding time, actually. I haven't got that down. I've just said 1.8 condensing. Oh, yeah, I've got expanding time there. This one's um, nearly a minute. It's a scene in a foundry where you'll, you get some molten metal. Um, we're also going to see um, 4.1, expert demonstration of skill. Um, we're seeing 2.3, dangerous place. And also 2.2, um, an inaccessible viewpoint. When the time is right to pour, the crucible is removed from the furnace using metal tongs and placed into a cradle for pouring. The surface layer of ash and charcoal must be removed to prevent it going into the mold and leading to faulty castings. Whilst we're using a metal skimmer, remember that prehistoric smiths would probably have used just a stick of green wood. Also, our modern plumbago crucible will withstand much higher temperatures than those used in prehistory, allowing more time for pouring the molten metal into the moulds. For a mass of about 200 grams of molten copper, about enough for one axe head, Prehistoric smiths would have had only about 10 to 15 seconds to perform the entire pouring procedure before the copper started to solidify. Okay, so um, now the expanding time was achieved as follows. Um, during that um, shot, we had some pouring started and then there was a cut to a close-up of the pouring which is a good thing to have. Close-ups are very important to have to, to give you the realism of what's hap happening. Now, that close-up, which was taken at a different time, or maybe with a different camera, no, I think it's at a different time. This was done twice, once shot wider and once shot close-up. And that close-up, if you look closely, it went back in time because we wanted to see more of the... Uh, uh, we wanted to see the close-up for a long time. So he was pouring like that, and when we cut to a close-up, actually, it, it was a bit earlier. So um, that actually expanded the time, and the reason it was expanding, you can't do, uh, do that very much, because it would be obvious. You'd get discontinuity. But the reason it was expanded is because the close-up was more interesting shot and we wanted a longer one of that. So that was expanding time. Now 4.1, the movements, experts demonstration of a craft skill, the movement and the speed of the expert bronze axe maker are shown. 2.3, taking people to dangerous places. Now it will be diff dangerous and difficult to get permission to take any students to a place like that. Um, and, I mean, very expensive to take each year's cohort of students there. But, of course, you're an online university, so you, you wouldn't want to do that anyway. 2.2, <laughs> um, inaccessible viewpoint. That extreme, that close-up of the pouring, if anyone was standing that close, their eyes would burn. So that would be completely inaccessible without video. So, next one, um, illustrates, it's, tw it's 30 seconds, illustrates movement, just 2.1. And in this one, um, a student in control engineering um, is demonstrating his final year project. ...system that will keep this beam steady by moving the face of it. It's like uh, balancing a pen on your finger and trying to keep it vertical, which is not terribly really easy to do. The computer measures the position of the beam and moves the truck to compensate when it starts to fall over. So uh, you go hit it and it uh, recovers. Okay. So without seeing that complex movement, it'd be very difficult to appreciate exactly the control that the computer's 
having. Um, I just noticed, incidentally, that music there, I wouldn't normally have music like that, um, but it's a promotional video to attract other students, so they thought we'd make it uh, sound nice, but uh, uh, my, for me, it takes away from the realism. You know, you want to, to hear the noise and the persons. If someone is speaking, there's no reason to have mu music. If you have music when someone is speaking, it means they're not saying anything important. You know, because why have something else to distract? Music is good. I'm not saying it's, you shouldn't have music, but I would, I would have music when there's nobody speaking and that signals to the viewer, just concentrate on this bit. Contemplate this bit. And the music has to be appropriate for what they're seeing. The, the style has to be appropriate. Now, um, the next one, uh, narrative power. Now, this sequence is quite a long one. It's one, well, it's over a minute. The sequence is actually a succession of three sequences used elsewhere in this video. And it's going to illustrate 1.9 narrative power of video. Croup and similar conditions cause extrathoracic airway obstruction. In this case, the extra pressure needed to breathe in through the obstruction exaggerates the slight extrathoracic airway narrowing that occurs in inspiration, causing a vibratory crowing noise as the airway narrowing becomes more severe. However, the distension occurring as the child breathes out relieves the obstruction. Let's see that too in real time. If you have difficulty with this concept, think of trying to drink through a soggy, half-chewed straw. Suck hard and it collapses. Blow bubbles through it and it functions perfectly. Okay, so now it's difficult in a short time to illustrate narrative power of video. So this is why I've showed sequence which is more than one shot there um, so normally you'd need to look at you get an idea of telling a story in this in this sequence because there's three shots we start with the action um, we start with 2.6 2 live action of the behavior that's the mother with the child am I getting the numbers right 2.6 right and um, then you get an animation of the internal organs, so that's 1.2. And finally you get an analogy, 1.3, with the straw. Now, um, concerning narrative power, which is 1.9, um, I call it power, but that power will be absent if the video is designed badly. I mean, if it's designed badly, the narrative can be completely disappear. Um, if it's designed with very quickly slapdash, lots of other things with, will disappear too. My, my claim that all these techniques add value, that won't be true if the design, if the pedagogic design is bad. And that's what the part two of this workshop is supposed to be about, the pedagogic design. So, uh, next one. Uh, 50 seconds. It illustrates again 1.3, a visual metaphor. How safe is the car? Close the window, run the central locking. You think if you lock the car, it must be safe. But is it? How often have you gone away from your car and wondered, will it still be there when I get back? Well, watch this.
Um, well, you may not have seen what, what I meant by a visual metaphor because what happened was that that thief just faded in. And I don't know if you noticed yeah. that, but it was quite quick. So it may not have been obvious. Perhaps I could have done it slower, but that's... So the idea is the metaphor, it comes like a ghost. It's as if he's a ghost and you, so you never see him. He was, he was a policeman, by the way, not a thief. <laughs> Actually, uh, there was another point I just struck me when seeing that the presenter himself uh, died a few years ago and um, I've never actually contacted his family to say is it okay for me to show him, you should really do that, that sort of thing. Um, and he was quite young too. Now then, <clears throat> Next one is uh, one and a half minutes. It demonstrates a craft skill. It shows the fitting of what's called a striking plate on um, when you're fitting a door to the door jam, the side of the door opening. This is a bit too light compared to my picture is darker, so it's not, it's not as good on here. Okay, so now of course eventually any trainee carpenter would need to uh, maybe see a face-to-face -face demonstration and also try it themselves with supervision from their trainer, but this is a good introduction. Um, now, it, I said it was 4.1 demonstration of skill, but it's also demonstrating several other things. 1.8, um, it foreshortens time. Um, there were several times there where we did a little mix and went ahead in time um, and even when there were cuts we we, we jumped ahead um, there was several times that also illustrates 2.2 .2, extreme close-up um, we were so close at one stage that again if if you tried to get that view you wouldn't be able to focus you'd be too close um, and then it also illustrates 2.10 um, staged event. Uh, even with uh, specialist equipment, the video eliminates the, the effort to stage the event repeatedly over and over for your students. If you're a if you're a face-to-face -face university, you obviously you're not, so you'd have to do this. Um, this was done, by the way, with one camera. And the way that was done is it was repeated several times with different um, sizes of shot and different angles and then edited together afterwards. Um, now the reason, now you could have done that with two cameras, one showing close up and one showing a wider shot. If you use two cameras you can't get perfect lighting for both cameras. So that's why this was done with one camera. Um, but nowadays that's thought of as maybe too purist. I mean, even feature films are now done with more than one camera. Uh, it was just an, 
at the, in the old days, people said, if you're going to be really professional, you've got to do it with one camera, do it several times with different shots. Nowadays, of course, it saves time if you've got two cameras. Um, and also, if you do it several times, you quite often have problems with continuity because they use a different hand the second time or something. So it's better, quicker, to use two cameras and you don't need to be so purist to say, I can't get perfect lighting. You can get pretty good lighting, even if it's two cameras. So, um, you know, I've, uh, I've shot with five cameras in a studio where there's very good control of what, what the camera sees and where the lighting is. Um, that's a BBC studio, I'm saying. But also in a classroom, I've shot with three cameras um, one wide one to see everything, one showing what the child is looking at, and one show, showing what the teacher's doing. So that's three cameras. But most of the time, you only need two cameras for, um, for classroom demonstration. The third one was, in case you couldn't edit and there was an extra shot that you could put in to avoid discontinuity. So, now, um, that was demonstration of a skill. Um, this next one is um, a two, a two extracts and with a black gap in between. And it's a video to encourage 14-year-olds to appreciate science. So it illustrates 3.3, stimulate the appetite to learn, and also 3.4, change attitudes and appreciations. Nothing's really as it seems. We used to get in hot and cold, and all that hot and cold is, is the speeds that the atoms are jiggling. If they jiggle more, it corresponds to hotter. The colder is jiggling less. If the ball comes down and bounces, it shakes irregularly some of the atoms in the floor. And then when it comes up again, it leaves some of those atoms moving jiggling so as it bounces it's passing its extra energies its extra motions to little patches on the floor each time it bounces and loses a little each time but all that emotion is still there in a form of the energy of motion in the form of the jiggling of the floor which is a little bit warmer unbelievable but anybody who's hammered a great deal on something knows that it's true the ends like each other, the different degrees. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon, and if they get near each other, they snap together. And so, if you have something like wood in oxygen, there's carbon in the wood from the tree, and the oxygen comes and hits it, carbon, but not hard enough, it just goes away again. The air is always coming, nothing's happening. If you can get it faster, by heating it up somehow, somewhere, somehow, get it started. A few of them come fast. They go over the top, so to speak. They come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster, so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms. And they jiggle, and they make mothers jiggle, and you get a terrible catastrophe, which is one after the other. All these things are going faster and faster and snapping in, and the whole thing is changing. That catastrophe is a fire. So, um, now the idea, why I'm saying it stimulates the appetite to learn is because I would contend that this man is very enthusiastic and gives you the feeling that it's exciting and interesting and so on. That's Richard Feynman, he's a double laureate in physics and um, he, he always insisted on teaching first year undergraduate and even, even secondary school kids. In fact, at one time he said, if you can't explain, um, what do you call it? If you can't explain something to 14 year olds, you don't understand it yourself. Uh, that's, that's what. So, uh, uh, he, he died a few months later, so he was actually ill there. That's, so that's why he was sitting in the chair, but th that movement still was there. You see the, yeah.
You see the enthusiasm that he's got. Mm -hmm. So now, if you can find truly inspirational teachers, use them instead of someone with a wooden face. You know? <laughs> so that stimulate the appetite to learn. 3.4, um, change attitudes, appreciations. Again, the appreciation. We're hoping that this does something for 14 year old kids. And you know, someone who is even a professor in physics would not dare to say some of the things he said. Um, oxygen and, they like each other and they want to get together, oxygen and carbon, you know. Um, well, they might say that, but certainly, I mean, at one stage he said, if you can speed it up, they go over the top, so to speak. They don't go anywhere they actually increase in the level of energy. So the level jumps up. But you see, he wasn't, so he wasn't telling the truth even. But that's Richard Feynman. So he, so, uh, he did that because he wanted to enthuse people and he wanted to give some kind of analogy of what's happening. You know. Anyway, so that's him. Incidentally, um, the book that I wrote, I wanted to have um, a DVD with it and I had problems with copyright. So it never did have a DVD. And instead, uh, my wife's an artist, so she illustrated it. Um, it took a long time, actually. Um, the BBC, for two minutes, wanted 250 pounds for this. That was nine years ago. And uh, another 250 if it was on CD-ROM, uh, and if it was on the internet, another 500. Now you imagine, with all of these, I, it's just impossible, I couldn't afford it. But in any case, there were lots of things I couldn't get copyright for at all, no matter what I paid. So therefore, uh, I didn't have a DVD. Now ideally, and I'm writing, I'm writing an update to my book, ideally that it would be an e-book so that you could click and see clips like this instead of just um, diagrams of the clips or screenshots of the clips. So um, there's only two more to go, I think. Um, yeah, this one is two minutes and uh, illustrates 2.5 fast motion and 2.10 staged event. The video shows uh, different individual styles of learning and two people are trying to assemble a stool from Ikea. Do you have Ikea here? Yeah, yes. Ikea? <laughs> so you, you probably know the situation. One decides he's going to fill in uh, what he thinks is a missing step in the instructions. Another one doesn't follow the instructions carefully. What I managed to do here is instead of looking at the instructions, I put the short screw in here so that when I had to put another screw in here, I found I had to take all these out, put them in again. <laughs> Trying to make a, a lazy conceptual leap. <laughs> it's in. It took me about half an hour to put that screw in. I think I'm See, sweating. <laughs> Just putting the last uh, screw in. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a beam of satisfaction, really. I've got to take the whole bloody thing to pieces now <laughs> because I screwed that too high up. And therefore the legs have splayed out too far, so I now can't put that ring on. The visual instructions were inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> doing this. 
spent them. I've been eating them. I've been needing a glass of something right now. <laughs> So it was left with an extra screw. <laughs> so the fast motion. Now, so the producer was there. Um, he was capitalizing on the natural humor in the situation by speeding it up four times and putting this honky tonk music there to achieve humor. Well, humor, humor is good um, because it's memorable. So it's good for learning, but it's actually very difficult to achieve. So often you try and get um, academic experts to tell a joke and it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, not, it, it's good if you can manage it. Um, then um, 2.10 staged event. The events are plainly staged, although the individual behaviors, they were spontaneous. But you know, we made sure nobody was walking behind them. This was in IKEA itself, so they, they allowed us to do it, and they didn't allow anybody to walk behind, or uh, there were no distractions. Everything was neatly stacked as well, so there was. I mean, normally, if you were real, well, they wanted the realism of being inside IKEA. Uh, personally, I would have had a blank background, but maybe I'm too purist. I don't. I wouldn't want any distractions in the background. Um, to illustrate different learning styles. There were actually uh, several more people making um, the stool, and then it was analysed. Yeah, that kind of thing, the different learning style. People who jumped past instructions because they were impatient, that sort of thing. So that's what it was illustrating. Um, now, um, there are, yeah, two more, sorry. So next one is, um, a two-minute compilation. It's a, it's a chronological sequence of a voiceover by a, a boy who's 16 years old, and he is just about to uh, through the year of his GCSE exam. Um, and the full video shows three other students, but I've edited it down to show only the one student. This is illustrating 3.2, motivate a strategy by demonstrating its success. Uh, 4.6, illustrating a studying skill. Um, 4.5, also alleviating isolation. Have I got the numbers right? No, I haven't. Hmm. Studying skill. Okay. Three po it's 3.5, not 4.5, yeah, alleviating isolation. Two minutes. You think it stopped?
when everyone's nervous, and I still am nervous. But I'm actually quite pleased that I've done, I've done enough revision. I'm quite happy that I've done enough revision. The actual experience of the exam is quite funny because when everyone's queuing up outside, the hall, everyone's very not tense, but sort of people are laughing a lot. It's like that like adrenaline is very high because you're about to go and do an exam, a GCSE exam. On the whole, I've actually, I actually enjoyed yesterday's exams. They were much easier than I expected. Much, much easier atmosphere. And I think I'm fairly confident. I think I'll do actually okay. I think I'll do all right. Four A stars, two A's, three B's, and a C. Actually, I'm, I'm happiest about the C because that, that was maths, and I was really unsure about whether I would pass it or not. Okay, that's... He was, he was he was the best of the four actually but you see the point there is Tom's exam strategy this was 2.3.2 motivate a strategy by showing its success so he's got a revision timetable he's writing the main points onto cards and so on actually I noticed he said ultimate zero is absolute zero no, no, no. anyway <laughs> um, 4.6 studying skills so Tom demonstrates his skill um, in exam strategy and 3.5 alleviate isolation um, this is showing other school children in other words other showing other students doing something would alleviate the isolation and of course this does apply for an online university <laughs> now um, the next one is one minute and again it's um, it's the same idea, it's for school children, and this is illustrating 3.6, reassure. It's two chief examiners explain how they, how they design exams. We never set papers to trick people. We try and set papers to give students the opportunity to demonstrate what they can do. It takes about 18 months from the time that you have the question in your head to the time it gets on to a printed exam paper before a candidate. The examiner in charge of a paper writes a draft and then it goes to a committee who will look at the paper and debate the paper and then it goes to somebody who's called a reviser and then it goes back to the examiner for further revision and then it begins to go to press and we start proofreading it and finding lots of errors in it usually. Oh, I think lots of students have fantasies that they're going to be tricked, but the mark of a good example... That was 3.6, reassure. I think it was a good thing to show uh, children so they don't ever think that there's uh, a trick, there's a trick question, unless you're going to have a trick question in your exams, of course. <laughs> um, and I think uh, the examiner it convincingly explains that there isn't um, a trick involved. Well, um, I've gone a bit more than an hour, I think, there. That's for sure I have. And um, we started late. And there, I didn't illustrate everything there, um, like 4.3, reasoning, or 4.5, language proficiency. There'll be some examples in part two for people who are staying. Um, body movements. 4.2, I didn't illustrate those, but you can imagine that you could have a shot of people dancing or people um, playing a game, table tennis or something, to show the techniques that are involved, you know. So, those are 34 potent pedagogic uses of video. So, in most places I've been, in fact, nearly all places I've been, um, very few of these techniques are used. So video is underutilized. It's got enormous power if you, if you do have the facilities and the time to do this kind of thing, to go outside and see demonstrations and so on, or inside to see skills demonstrations, rather than um, having, you know, head and shoulders, someone talking in a video, or even someone with PowerPoint in a video, or even someone with a, a tablet drawing on their PowerPoint slides. Yeah, that's okay, but you see there's much more that can be done with video. So now we're supposed to have a little break. Yeah. Okay, so 
Um, you have the handouts. Um, one is eight pages, and um, one is just two pages. I don't think we're going to get. We're not going to reach the stage of using the the one sheet which has got things on two sides because that's supposed to be an exercise at the end where we have half an hour. Well, we're running so late, we're not going to be able to do that. So it's just the eight pages we're going to go through. And I'm going to talk about how to design videos so that it's pedagogically effective. And the design principles in table one uh, of the handout are based on the ideas at the BBC Open University, where I was for 22 years. Um, there are actually how many of those principles? I think there are, I think there are 29 principles there. Anyway, um, and there's eight categories. So, have uh, familiarize yourself with those for a while. Okay, so the aim of the design framework there, that is table one, is to provide the best possible uh, learning experience. And that means structuring the video in such a way that it preempts the difficulties you feel the student will have. As an experienced teacher, where do you think their difficulties will be? And hopefully you're going to preempt those difficulties. <clears throat> now, the opportunities to develop this framework arose in 1982 at the <clears throat> BBC Open University. And that was the first year when the British Council asked us to take over a course they used to run for overseas producers of educational video. And so we ran a three-month course um, for overseas producers, China, India, lots of places, Malaysia. And there were about 12 producers each year. We ran it for 10 times, 10 years. And so therefore we had to stop and think hard about our intuitive ideas about how to make educational video. And that original skeleton of our ideas on screenwriting, that's what I call designing uh, for video, that's undergone several revisions and table one is the result. This is a summary of the ideas. And how did it come about? Well, when we were trying to teach these producers, we would notice some new features of good educational videos and we thought, well, we haven't put that down in our summary. Yes, that's such and such. It means it, perhaps it was number 7B, re-exemplify something. Um, and then we also we, we saw bad videos. We thought, what is missing about that? So therefore we gradually built up this structure. And those ideas gave us ideas how to add, subtract, modify the pedagogic screenwriting table. So, looking at those ideas, which I will illustrate um, later, just um, some words first. Um, it gives a pedagogic, that table gives a pedagogic structure for each chapter of a narrative. So, if you're telling, say, a long story, it was developed for long form narrative video, so called, which is like 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, but the table relates to each section of the content or each chapter of the story. So therefore, if you're making a short video of five minutes, that still would apply, that table. Um, now, most, most of the categories structure the learning experience, so they're instructivist. Uh, but if you look at category four, that returns control to the learner, and so does category three to an extent. Actually, category three, in my new book, um, I've changed the name to be um, Cognitive Engagement. But <laughs> so I've left that as Facilitate Attentive Viewing. So it means really thinking hard while watching the video. Okay, um, then um, category four, the term constructivist learning. I'm sure you've all heard of this term and know it. Um, knowledge is not passively received but built up by the learner 
um, on the basis of their ex existing knowledge. And so the learner organizes it individually, constructivist. Um, and that's what Category 4 is trying to enable this constructive learning. Now, there are, I don't know how many, 29 individual design principles, or 28, I haven't counted them. So you have a choice of several principles or techniques for each of the eight categories. But it's, it's not supposed to be a prescription. You don't just follow this as it goes. Even a whole category is not necessarily going to be used. For example, you look at category two, signpost, various ways of saying what's coming. If the next thing is a surprise, you don't want category two at all. So, and normally it's appropriate to use one, maybe two um, items from each of the eight um, in any section, in any chapter. Now I'm going to illustrate some of the principles. Um, the first thing I'm going to look at is, um, and you can make notes in your handout, that I've left some spaces on page one onwards, page one and two, yeah, on page one and two, I've left a bit of space for you to make notes. Um, it's one of the exercises I'm going to show you from a three-day workshop I gave in Kenya to a vocational um, and vocational engineering polytechnic lecturers, they were. Um, so vocational educational, vocational education and training, VET, VET. And this was um, done by Frida and she's um, a lecturer in, in cooking. Um, so it's um, cake building, cake making, sorry. Hello, welcome to this practical lesson on cake baking. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to follow a step-by-step -step procedure to bake a simple cake. How do you bake a cake? It is not difficult. Here is how. First, it is important to ensure you have all the things you need before you get started. Preheat the oven. ready for baking. Prepare the baking tin by rubbing margarine on the inside of the tin. so that the cake does not stick. Shake off any excess flour. Now, what about the ingredients? They are listed in your video notes. Okay, so I stop there to point out that when she says video notes, in fact, I'm going to show you the video notes. This illustrates that caveat that I've got at the bottom of underneath table one, that educational video by itself can't achieve all levels of cognition and skill. And it illustrates one of these extra things that I've said might be needed, and that's printed guidance. Um, so these were the video notes that Frida also was going to give to the trainees. And so everything she does in the video is also um, and at the bottom, 11, the cake is ready for eating. <laughs> um, so a, a, a very intensive training kind of a video for, for skills. Um, but um, although this may be kind of going a bit too far as far as 
your videos are concerned in being absolutely step by step. She, everything she says has got a, a caption as well on the screen and so on. Um, nevertheless, um, it's important to realize that video by itself is certainly, you know, it's limited as to what it can do, but it can be a very important part of your multimedia uh, program. Um, I want to look at um, something a bit later in the program um, at 4.51. Two. Of the, with a spatula or spoon. Right, so in a moment she's going to say um, add a little milk to ensure that you have the right consistency. To ensure that everything is mixed thoroughly. Then add a little milk to ensure you have the right consistency of the butter. So now I want to ask you a question. What do you think she meant by the right consistency? Could you tell from the video what she meant? Mm -hmm. I think more by sort of showing how the Right. So that's that was a missing shot. Yeah. So you, so you saw what was missing. Actually, that she did shoot that, but something went wrong and she she couldn't use it. Yeah. So, um, okay. In that sense, that the viewer's not told how to judge the right consistency. So certainly, picking up a spoon and showing it drop down. Uh, now, what I'm illustrating here, and I'm going to illustrate with quite a few ideas is 6b enhanced legibility so that's what I'm going to do um, for quite a few uh, as you see in your table um, I'm going to look at 6b enhanced legibility and or, or audibility um, so that was one defect as far as 6b is concerned that the the legibility of knowing what you mean by the right consistency that wasn't shown um, there were a few problems during this some shots were not uh, not available and um, and she was the best one actually but um, I mean it's something to do with the camera was wrong so the shot was not available um, one of the participants shooting the camera she went home with her camera and um, so the guy lost all his close-up shots. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> she went to a different country in Africa. <clears throat> now, another. I'm going to look at defects in legibility, and here's another one which we'll look at. Right. Burnout, as we call it, the shot being too dark. Now, why is that shot too dark? You would think maybe it's because there's no lights, but actually there is some light, but it's the background that's bleeding through. And even though there's um, those blinds there, they're not enough. So if you are shooting in a room like this, you need um, some black, um, what do you call it? Um, See-through material, what do you call that? But black. Um, netting. Mm -hmm. Now this netting that's up there, those blinds there, are probably not enough. If you were to put, pull those down and stand someone in front, they would still get this kind of effect. But of course, that, it, with a bit more lighting, that might have been better. Um, it was very important in Kenya because black people need even more lighting right, than white people. So that was one of the things that went wrong now and again in, uh, in the shots. Um, so how do you achieve this? There's the black netting, which I've talked about, but also lighting. And most cameras have built-in lights, but extra lights are definitely a good idea. 
especially for tight close-up shots, they need more light. So I know that you've got some experts in this kind of thing, but there are lots of people who do their own videos, aren't there? So they just go out and do some videos, so it's a shame they're not here, <laughs> a lot of them. Anyway, then second, um, the second uh, defect, shooting only a single shot. This is what she did. There was only the one camera and she shot a single um, one shot which was following the action, zooming in when she went to the oven to see the temperature and so on. Now that's much less effective than if you intercut between say a wide shot and a close-up shot. And to do that, well, I've mentioned before that you could shoot a sequence twice and then the second time you would shoot all the close-up shots the first time or the wide shots and then you edit in between them. Um, good close-up shots are essential for anything that you want to show that needs activity. But number three, shooting with only one camera, which is what I've been talking about, when you shoot um, something twice, I mentioned before, continuity can be a problem because you could use a different hand this time instead of... So an alternative is to shoot with two cameras. And so that's item four on page two of your handout. Oh, sorry, not, it's not item four. It's still on page three. Uh, shooting... So I would... On, on item three, so item three, I'm saying I recommend shooting with two cameras. That might be something that's difficult here, but uh, if you've got a colleague and uh, they've got a camera, why not have two cameras? And they can be your smartphone. Now, number four is something that some of the Kenyan people did, which was staying in close-up all the time. I've said that close-up is very important and it's very valuable to have close-ups, but if you stay in close-up all the time, then you lose the context. And this happened in one of the, one of the exercises, which was um, building um, the motherboard of a computer. And we saw very big close-ups of the motherboard. Sorry, the motherboard is this big, but the close-ups were only this big for each, each item that was put in. So you couldn't see the geography of the whole thing. You didn't know where each item was relative to the next one. It, the camera would move like this and then so you thought where was the last one so that's also a bad thing if you have only close-up shots handheld objects um, waving about so if you're shooting something which requires an object and and your demonstrator is holding it like this you think my hand is not moving but it is moving and if you've got a close-up it moves quite a way across the screen so you need to have it stuck on the ground instead of up like this or have not have the person ha handling it. The static solid su um, surface either for your hand plus the object or the object itself is a good idea. Now then number six using only the built-in microphone. Now the cameras have built-in microphones and um, cell phones have the worst built-in microphones. Uh, so that's an important thing is to have a separate microphone like I've got here. Um, now it doesn't have to be a radio microphone like that, it could be a microphone sat, sat on the desk because the person speaking needs to have the microphone near them and yet you need to also see other things that are going along, and sorry, here other things that are happening like tapping and so on. Um, so I'm talking now about a presenter who's in vision. An alternative is, as I say on the uh, number six, you could do a voiceover instead. So you could shoot the whole demonstration and then afterwards, which is what Frida did with her cake, she was the person who was demonstrating, but she didn't speak while demonstrating. She spoke afterwards and then edited the soundtrack onto that. 
Um, then number seven, do not cut from a shot in which the camera is zooming or moving. So movement, especially when the whole picture has changed, um, n requires a lot of mental processing. So therefore, if, if, a, if a shot is moving and then you cut to another shot, the viewer is still processing that movement because there's so much to see because of the movement that they would miss the first second or so of the next shot. So wait until you stop before cutting. Um, when adding new text, so that's um, number eight. Okay, when adding new text, do not jump cut existing text, instead animate. Let me show you an example of that. So I'm going to show you two versions of uh, the same thing. It's going to rain tomorrow. <coughs> I know, but at least it's going to be sunny on the weekend. I really miss my friend, Susie, in the US. <coughs> well, at least she's visiting next month. My favorite soccer team lost the cup. <laughs> yeah, but at least they won the league. So you see there, the word at least jumped on and all the other words jumped away in order to leave room. Um, and that, that doesn't give a good impression of the relationship of where the new words come with the others. So that's jump, and that's the same as you'd get if you had a PowerPoint slide that suddenly changed. Um, and that was the original version, which I objected to, and so the second year they changed it to this version here. Positive yönleri bulmaya çalışalım. Her cümlede doğru yere at least ekleyeceksiniz. Her cümleyi cevaplamanız için size yeterli süreyi vereceğiz. It's going to rain tomorrow. I know, but at least it's going to be well, sunny on the weekend. So you know where it fits. I really miss my it. friend, Susie, in the US. Well, at least she's visiting next month. My favorite soccer team lost the cup. Yeah, but at least they won the league. So there's a general point about um, when some text or some equation is modified that you need you need to be able to compare the new item with the old. And so, so another example of this is if you have a mathematics equation and suddenly it's changed, um, the best idea would be to leave the old equation there so they compare and have the new one underneath it. So they could have done that with this as well. But instead, you could do it with an animation. Okay, so um, next one. <clears throat> now, um, number nine, blanketing the whole video with music. Um, people sometimes do this because it's much quicker to shoot mute without any sound, if you're outside, for example, and especially if there's a lot of traffic and so on. Um, and then they cover the video with a lot of music instead of having the location sound. So as I mentioned, I think, before, that the realism is severely depleted if you don't have the actual location sound and you can see, hear people walking and so on. Some people, very professional people, actually do it on purpose, but they put the sounds on afterwards. But that's very time consuming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do they do that? Why would they put music on instead of using the real sounds? Is it 
cheaper? It's much quicker. Right. If you shoot um, with sound, it takes much longer. Because it's really the, the fashion now, on, on, certainly in the UK, well, yeah, without the, the location sound. Annoying, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the sound doesn't, the music doesn't actually fit anyway, but no. even when it fits, you know, it's much more realistic to show the location sound. So, uh, after my feeling about all this is um, that um, thing which I've highlighted in grey, that when learners are hanging by their fingernails to something that's conceptually difficult, the slightest defect in the picture or the sound can make them fall off that precipice. So they've lost and then the next thing they can't understand and so on. Now so, so far we've looked at defects in vision. Now I'm going to describe um, techniques to achieve good vision. Um, and it, so we're still on 6B, enhance legibility or audibility. Um, so the producer needs to plan meticulously, that's one of the things in order to ensure all the objects and performers are in the right place, doing the right thing. The conditions are purposely restricted, like I said, there's nobody walking behind and so on. So that you ex exclude extraneous things which could distract. So that's one, one um, aspect of enhancing legibility. The second one is close-up shots. Close-up shots are essential. Uh, to maintain interest as well as to enhance legibility. Um, and incidentally, the camera, well, if you've got a camera that's got, that, that's got a tripod, um, you need to lock it off so that it doesn't move if you're taking close-ups. If, if they're extreme close-ups. If you're trying to do it with a handheld camera, you'll see that movement, it'll be very bad. Um, then design the shape and position of equipment um, and graphics to fill the screen shape as far as possible. Now, here's a, this example that you've got down there. I'll, I'm going to explain what that means. Um, the left-hand side is what we actually saw. So. That's what we saw, that's, that's what's on the left hand side in your handout. Now the model there is too small to, see, to be seen on the screen. Um, okay, um, this is a shot where you wanted to see the presenter, but while the presenter's talking, uh, there's no point having an object next to them which they can't see. They might want to have a look, look now and again. Sometimes we looked in close up, but even when they're talking in general, the viewer is, had better be able to see it properly. So what did I do? The bench was too small. Sorry, it was too low. So what I did, if you look at the left-hand side now, is I raised the bench. And then I zoomed in. So I can see he's larger as well as uh, the plastic model of the brain. Incidentally, we sent the students only half that model to save, save money because it's nearly the same as the other half of the brain. <laughs> and what's, what's, uh, what your picture is showing is the problem, which is the wasted screen space. So that space, when you waste screen space, in other words, when your shot is not the same shape as your screen, then there are going to be things in it which are smaller than they should be. So the general rule is design the shape and position of equipment to fill the screen shape as far as possible because wasted screen space um, prevents a closer, more legible shot. Um, now, a more important example comes next, which is concerning um, uh, diagrams. If you look at your next page, you compare figure two with figure three. Figure two is the textbook version of um, figure three. Figure three is the TV version. So let me explain some of the points of the difference. Um, students 
first of all, students were familiar with the abbreviation, the Greek letter psi, meaning psychology, so we didn't have to write down the whole word psychology used in figure three, you use psi. Um, in any case, the presenter verbalized everything as they described things, they were pointing to this board. Um, he also expanded them, for example, he pointed out which levels related to behavior, that's the third column of figure two, and which levels related to brain. So the video diagram, diagram on the video, did not need a third column with behavior and brain because the narration talked about that. Now, at the outset, the presenter explained the significance of the bands of color. Um, they indicate which discipline left relates to which phenomenon right. So, for example, neuroanatomy, which is a pink band, um, relates to systems and pathways on the right because they're in pink. And then, because of that zigzag arrangement, the colored bands could be used to indicate when a discipline related to two phenomena on the right. So, uh, this is where your creative uh, graphic designer came in. You know, this wasn't my idea. All the zigzag and the coloring, that was, that was his idea when I explained. There's the diagram I want to illustrate, figure two. He said, oh my God, he said, can't do that. And, and so this is what we came up with. Um, then um, neurophysiology, if we look at that, that's, um, that's both on the left, it's both pink and red, and it relates to systems and pathways, but also to neurons, which is red. And just below that, neurochemistry relates to both neurons and subcellular. Now, there's enormous number of simplifications. You're going to have diagrams that are complicated like this, which on video you'd want to simplify. Um, first of all, the discipline of electrophysiology has been omitted completely. That was there in uh, figure two. Um, systems and pathways in figure two, they're combined in one band on the right of figure three. So the discipline of physiological psychology is shown related to both of them instead of just to systems. So in other words, it's not quite true. So what? You need to simplify in a video, especially a time-based video, and remember the text is still there for them to get the details. The words behavior and brain are omitted on the right. I mentioned that earlier. Now, so such, those simplifications can be justified on me, uh, several counts. First of all, the spoken words in the program of the narration can augment what's in the picture. So that's one reason. And so that recovers some of the complications. And then TV is not the most appropriate medium to deal with fine details. TV is much better for overview of a topic. And um, but an overview can be very useful um, to give the overall view of a thing after, after or before people have looked at details. Um, because details need a static medium to be studied at the pace of the student, not at the pace of the moving picture. Um, nevertheless, um, so, sorry, and what, I haven't said that here, but nevertheless, di don't be scared of using diagrams as long as you actually um, design them well and also have them these, the, incidentally, that diagram fits the shape of the screen as we had it in those days. Nowadays, we've got HD screens, so that would, the top one is more like an HD um, format. Yeah, but um, the bottom one is um, a four by three format, as we had in those days. So diagrams are very important to, even if you haven't got a diagram in your text, it's still a good idea sometimes to include extra diagrams on um, the video to introduce, to track what you're doing or to summarize any depicted ideas uh, to clarify concepts. Um, so this, I'm talking now about principle 6C, maximize cognitive clarity. By using 
evocative, simplified diagrams. So now I've done one more item, 6C. So now we'll go on to more design principles, which I'm going to illustrate by showing clips from some of my own videos. And I'm going to start with um, a UK Open University program shot on the location I mentioned before, Dominance and Subordinacy. It's part of an interdisciplinary course, Biology, Brain and Behaviour. And um, it's for second level undergraduate students. And I'm going to play two clips from this. The first one consists of just shots one to three. And the post-production transcript is on page five or four, on page four of your handout. Um, but don't bother to look at that until you've seen shots one to three because I'm going to show them again and we'll look at the transcript later. So far in this course, we've concentrated mostly on individual animals, often in contrived laboratory situations. But many animals live for most or all their lives in social groups. This is the part of the course where we concentrate on social behavior. Okay, so now what I'm going to illustrate here is 6a, vary the tempo to indicate syntax. What I mean by syntax is, is it something that's just a new sentence or is it a, a new paragraph or is it a completely new section? That's what I mean by syntax in this case. Um, and um, I'm going to show you how the tempo in this sequence of shots one to three um, actually clarified the syntax. So, looking back at your, at your handout, uh, top of page four, um, notice the pauses in the narration in shots one, two, and three. And I'm going to look at where they're positioned in relation to the cut um, to the next picture. So, you see it says pause three and a half seconds at the end of shot one. In other words, the narration stopped for three and a half seconds. And then we cut to the picture shot two. Uh, as soon as we cut, there was pause a half, that's half a second. So in other words, there was a long pause before and a short pause afterwards. Then um, at the end of shot two, there was another short pause, pause one second. But when we cut to shot three, there was a long pause, pause three seconds. So let me replay those three shots so that you can experience those pauses. So far in this course we've concentrated mostly on individual animals, often in contrived laboratory situations. Long pause. But many animals live for most or all their lives in social groups. Another long pause. This is the part of the course where we concentrate on social behaviour. So far in this course we've concentrated mostly on in I want it again. <laughs> um, so, now, uh, why did I do that? N the topic of shot one is individual animals, whereas in shot two we change to uh, the topic changes um, to groups of animals, and that's indicated in the box below those shots, written in red. And shot three is also about groups of animals. Now, the point is the tempo is supposed to make clear that shot two is a new topic, whereas shot three is not a new topic. That's the point of the tempo, and why is that? Um, at the end of the narration of shot one, there's a long pause, whereas after we cut to shot two, there's a short pause. And the reason for that uneven tempo is to help viewers realize that shot two is new. The long pause at the end of shot one gives the viewers time to finish taking in that topic individual animals in this case and to recognize that the topic has ended because there's a long pause and nothing is being said about it. Now if there are any doubt that it's finished then the almost immediate narration afterwards when you cut to shot two that interrupts any lingering thoughts so now they know it must be something new because something's being said about it and 
what they hear being said is that it's social, it's a social group. Now, so that's the, that's the transition between shot one and two. Now, in contrast, the transition between shot two and three are actually, is actually the reverse of that. Because at the end of shot two, it's a short pause, and at the beginning of shot three, it's a long pause. And the point is that it's a continuation of the topic. Shot three is still groups of animals, social living, same as shot two. Now that continuation, that's the reason for the different uh, pauses. And what happens is this, the short pause at the end of shot two, because there's a short pause, it identifies shot three as being a further illustration of what's just been said. If you say a sentence and then cut immediately, viewers interpret that new shot as being illustrating what you've just said. Um, so therefore, they're going to imagine that it's the same topic. Well, they're sure it's the same topic when you have a long pause, because nothing, is, nothing new is said about it. So there's a long pause in shot three. Um, there's no words to interrupt the contemplation of shot three. So I'll just finally play it once again. Individual animals, often in contrived laboratory situations. But many animals live for most or all their lives in social groups. This is the part of the course where we concentrate on social behavior. So far in this course, we've concentrated most... Sorry about that. So, now, um, this, um, these pauses, you, wouldn't, you don't have to do them as a presenter at time. This is a voiceover, obviously, so you can do that pause. You would achieve that in editing afterwards. So you would change the pauses, whatever was being said. You're unlikely to tell someone who's recording a voiceover, okay, pause three seconds here and one second there. But you'd have an editing to achieve that later on. And incidentally, the appropriate duration is not one second or three seconds. It depends on what the shot's like. If the shot has a lot of movement, three second pause in narration sounds shorter than three seconds. So you have to judge. Let me tell you an apocryphal story about one of our students in the courses who got the wrong pacing. He shot something on a, um, a freeway service station, a motorway service station, and he was explaining that there are restaurants there and there are various facilities and there's toilets and so on. So he shot um, a restaurant, then a cafe, then another restaurant. And then the narration said, so there are many places to eat. And he cut immediately to a toilet. <laughs> right? No pause at all. There are many places to eat. And all the other students laughed. He said, why are you laughing? He said, well, you said we eat in the toilet. He said, no. He said, if you look, if you look carefully, the words about the restaurant are in the restaurant shot. And the words about the toilet, which came later, because he said later, and there are public, and there are conveniences as well. Words about the toilet are in the toilet shot. So I'm sure that the BBC editor uh, left that in on purpose, because the, the student was saying, I want it like this, just to, to give him a lesson. And I think he got that lesson. <laughs> If you say, so there are many places to eat, and cut immediately, they interpret the new shot as being illustration of what you've said. So that's 6A, very temp. Now, um, so that's got much more complicated ideas than the um, legibility ones that I was talking about before. Um, I would say probably that's, that's the most complicated design principle in that table. You know, how, to, how to get the pacing right so that it helps the learner. Um, 
before we go on to any more, um, has anyone got any questions or comments? Now, the next clip is from the same video but much later and it's the part of the video concerns uh, society of a group of monkeys and just before the shots I'm going to show you um, which is shot 25 and 26 um, there's um, an example of mating which I've, I'm not showing the next the reason I mention it is because there's a caption on the screen which says mating the next two shots illustrate care of infants and the way this is done illustrates item 4a words should not duplicate pictures you would think that they should duplicate pictures but this one it says do not duplicate pictures so that's shots 25 and 26 and I'll play for you they show a rhesus monkey mother who's suckling her baby and simultaneously she's grooming an older offspring they care for their young and they may do so for several years Right, so the narration's talking about individual animals and says they care for their young and they may do so for several years. Now if the narration had been a literal description of the shots, it would have said individual mothers suckle their babies and groom their older offspring. That would have been exactly what's shown on the screen. Um, and so it doesn't add anything. Instead, what the actual sentence is a generalization of what was on the screen individual animals care for their young and they may do so for several years so therefore the viewer then interprets the pictures as being a generalization they contribute their own interpretation and so they're thinking rather than just sitting there they should deduce that suckling is one way of caring for the young there must be lots of other ways they care for their young suckling is one way and they also should deduce that the animal being groomed is an older sibling. So they're actually making those interpretations, which means they're thinking. And so that's why you don't literally say in the narration what you see in the pictures. Um, and the whole point for all the items in um, category three and four is to encourage active viewing rather than passive reception. Right, next um, is a much longer um, sequence I'm going to show you, which is a mathematics program. Um, well, it's not mathematics, it's, it's um, the psychology of problem solving. So it was in a mathematics um, program and in a mathematics course, but this was a special program on the, on psychology rather than mathematics and the psychology of problem solving. Um, I'm only going to show you part of it, six minutes. Um, it ended up with a list of the things that people do when they're solving problems. We won't see that list. What we're going to see instead is um, um, some people um, that are, sorry, they are students in a studio which are trying to solve a problem and there's a tutor there helping them and that's going to that would then illustrate problem solving techniques and stages that you go through um, so you've got the transcript there on page four onwards and i'm going to go through it section by section and the first principles i want to illustrate come under category three facilitate attentive viewing um, let me play it first. Imagine a circle. A circle which is fixed and another one of the same size, which is free to roll on the fixed one. If I roll it all the way around the fixed one, just once, how many times will it rotate about its own center? For example, if it were a coin rolling around the fixed circle, 
The question is, how many times would the queen's head go around on itself? Make a guess. Actually, we're more interested in the metal processes you've been using than in the problem itself. It's not the answers to problems we want to investigate, but the mental processes in problem solving. So, taking the rolling problem as our first example, let's observe a group of students trying to solve it. Joan Bliss is setting the problem. So, this coin rolls on that one, one complete lap, till it comes back to where it started from. When this happens, how many times does the coin turn on its own center? How many times does the queen's head go around on itself? Jim. Once. Once? Sure not. Once. I think it might be three times. All right. Jim, would you like to try and explain to Charlotte and Dave why you think it's once? Well, if, if you move it round, as, as, the, as the coin goes round, so the queen's head turns round with it, and it would do, as I see it from here, it would do one complete revolution to get when it got back to where it started from. Is that what you think, Charlotte? No. Dave, what, how can you try and convince the others of your answer? Um, when you started to rotate it just now, I thought the outside one was turning quicker than it would need just to turn around once. Mm. While they're thinking about it, let's see what actually happens as we roll the coin all the way round. The coin has only done a quarter lap, yet the head is now upside down. So the head's done half a revolution on itself already. Now the head's done one full revolution. And that's a further half revolution on itself, making one and a half so far. So the head does two full revolutions altogether. Let's see that again. Let's now rejoin the students who haven't yet seen the coin roll round. Remember, only David guessed it was more than one revolution. It seemed too simple just to be once. Okay. But does anything that Jim or Charles has said change your mind? I don't those two to one. Perhaps they may be right. <laughs> no, well, do, you, do you think they're right? <laughs> um, would you like to turn it just a bit for me? Okay, well, <laughs> as we have it here, let's do it, shall we? They're going to find out now, just as we did, that the answer is two. While they're doing that, let's see why it's two. Most people give an answer of one, just like Jim and Charlotte, because they only see part of what's going on. If we make Jim's rough idea more precise, it comes out something like this. The top coin travels once around the rim of the fixed one. And since the two rims are equal, then each point on the rolling rim must come into contact just once with the fixed rim. Well, that's quite correct. There's nothing wrong with the reasoning, as far as it goes. But it's not the full story. Let's concentrate on the rim of the fixed coin, and let's unwrap it into a straight line. Now, if we roll the top coin along the straightened rim, each point of that top rim will touch just once, so the coin will roll exactly one full revolution. Now you can see why the answer isn't just one, why we have to add a second revolution. It's simply that in the original problem, the coin didn't roll along a line, it rolled around the bottom coin. So as it rolled, its path was also wrapping around the bottom coin. And this wraparound is where the second revolution comes from. So there are two components to the motion. The rolling component 
mm -hmm. and an additional orbiting component. Okay. Who got the right answer? No one? No. I, did, I didn't get the right answer. I got the first guess. It was, it was rolling very quick. Then I said, no, no, it cannot be that. All oh, right, yeah. Then I said, no, one. <laughs> but, but I had a present person. So it was quicker than... Okay, now, there's lots of um, principles being illustrated here. Um, so if you look at now your transcript, you see that I've written um, things in boxes down there. In the, um, On page four, um, there are two illustrations of principle 3a, pose questions, and two of principle 3b, encourage prediction. Um, in fact, they, they occur in the first five shots, um, and I'm going to play those again, and then I explain um, posing questions and encouraging prediction. Imagine a circle, a circle which is fixed and another one of the same size, which is free to roll on the fixed one. If I roll it all the way around the fixed one, just once, how many times will it rotate about its own center? For example, if it were a coin rolling around the fixed circle, the question is, how many times would the queen's head go around on itself? Make a guess. Okay. So, um, if you look at your script then, um, right at the beginning, he says, um, imagine a circle. Now, this is uh, intended to encourage prediction. It's trying to say to the, to the viewer, what have an image of a circle in fact it was said during only one second of a black screen and actually that wasn't long enough really but you can't put a black screen on a, a video for say five seconds people will think something's gone wrong with their player so um, I should have added more but probably three seconds would have been sufficient so the viewers starting to think uh, and trying to imagine the circle. So that's right at the top. Then later on, um, he said, if you look at the script, um, how many times will it rotate about its own center? And then there's a pause of two seconds. So that's 3A, pose questions. Then in shot five, um, there's another um, question. How many times would the queen's head go around on itself? Again, 3A pose questions. Then if you turn the page, there's another encouraged prediction. It says, make a guess. Um, and there's seven second pause, um, allowing people to make a guess. So that's two examples of each of those ideas. Now coming back though to page four, there was some other things there. Um, seven A, repetition with a new angle. Um, the first, the first question was just a circle going round another circle. But now it was repeated with a new angle, and this time it's the queen's head going round. And why did I do that? And the reason for that is 6C, to maximize clarity. I wasn't sure people would know what's meant, what you meant by um, how many times will it rotate about its own center. So I rephrased the question in order to clarify it. How many times would the Queen's head go round of itself? So that's 6C, maximize clarity. So that's just those first five shots um, illustrating um, those principles. Um, next, I'm going to play the next three shots to illustrate um, 5A priming and various other things, shots 7 to 10. Actually, we're more interested in the mental processes you've been using than in the problem itself. It's not the answers to problems we want to investigate, but the mental processes in problem solving. So, taking the rolling problem as our first example. Okay, so there, 
Um, if you look at uh, the script, it says 4B visual metaphor. So the rolling, the, the cogs are a visual metaphor for thinking. Okay. Um, but that wasn't the main reason I put those in. I put those cogs in there for um, principle 5A, priming. Um, what I wanted to do was try and give a hint to the viewer that it's more than one rotation. Now, if you were to look at those cogs going round, you would see it's more. But actually, they're going too fast for that I'm to be saying, obvious. How many people played that slow motion? <laughs> right, that's right. Um, if I'd have made it um, any slower, that would have given the game away. So I just wanted to give some sort of hint. Um, and that happens actually throughout the program that we're trying to make the viewer feel cleverer than the contestants okay by giving them some hints and you'll see that uh, I'll, I'll come back to that that idea later on um, so that was um, priming 5a planting is like planting a seed in the viewers mind which might that might have an effect to uh, later on so that they suddenly see what's happening now the whole of those shots um, six, 6 to 11 were setting the scene because it's telling what's happened and that there's going to be a group of students so that's principle 2a comes there now I'm going to jump over the next few shots and I'm going to restart at shot 27 to illustrate some more things and you see that's going to be 5B comes there. I'm going to play from shots 27 to 32. Example, while they're thinking about it, let's see what actually happens as we roll the coin all the way round. The coin has only done a quarter lap, yet the head is now upside down. So the head's done half a revolution on itself already. Now the head's done one full revolution. And that's a further half revolution on itself, making one and a half so far. So the head does two full revolutions altogether. Let's see that again. Okay, so um, I was try I'm trying to illustrate 4C, scaffold knowledge construction, concrete before the abstract. What I mean by that is we actually saw the answer before the theory was shown later on with unwrapping to go into a straight line. So that's one example of scaffolding the learner's construction of knowledge. Um, there's lots of ways of scaffolding I mean, um, and that's a metaphor used by constructivist theorists um, to show to mean supporting the learners to construct knowledge that they can't quite achieve on their own okay so going from concrete to abstract is one there you could go from simple to the complex for example in a video about children's behavior you might show interactions between a pair of children um, and then within a larger group of children. So that would be from the simple to the complex. Or you might go from the specific to the general. You might show children competing for toys, for example, and then competing for attention, and then explain competing for resources in general. So you're going from the specific competing for a toy to the general competing for resources simple to the general in fact that idea now I think about it illustrates 7b re-exemplify um, I, I haven't got a clip of that but if you want to show competing if you show compete children competing for toys 
and them for attention, you've given two examples of resources. So, re-exemplify a concept. Now back to the transcript, and you see I've got uh, just above shot 27, 5B, consistent fade down and fade up into animations. Now, so that illustrates consistent style. Um, you may not have noticed, but whenever we go from the studio to an animation, we always fade down to black and fade up from black. Now there's lots of ways of having that transition, but what I'm saying is, don't change it. So every time that happened, we'll, and even at the end of the animation, we fade it down from black and fade it up to, fade it up from black to the studio. Well, more consistency, of course, the cloth on the table in the studio was black. There's another consistency. Um, right, so now the final thing is uh, returning to the video, the next 50 seconds illustrate that illustrates that same fade down to fade up consistency, uh, starting at shot 36. Sorry. Um, it ends with shot 36. Um, and we're going to show two examples of uh, 5C, reassure and build confidence. Let's now rejoin the students who haven't yet seen the coin roll round. Remember, only David guessed it was more than one revolution. It seemed too simple to just to be once. Okay, but does anything that Jim or Charles just said change your mind? Not both two to one. Perhaps they may be right. <laughs> no, well, do you do you think they're right? I mean, um, would you like to turn it just a bit for me? Okay. Well, as we have it here, let's do it, shall we? They're going to find out now, just as we did, that the answer is two. While they're doing that, let's see why it's two. Most people give an answer of one, just like Jim and Charlotte. Okay, so, um, illustrating um, reassurance or building confidence. Um, that was the last sentence said. Most people give an answer of one, so therefore... You're not stupid if you think it's one, because most people do. Um, but um, there's also not something he said, but the way the video was structured. Um, but if you look earlier on, he said, they're going to find out now just as we did. That illustrates the fact that you, the viewers, were always one step ahead of the participants. Uh, you could call them the competitors in a quiz show. And um, they, they had their, the concepts explained to them after you, the viewer, had the concept explained. They had the problem given to them after you had the problem given to you. So you were always one step ahead. And again, what, what was I trying to do? I was trying to make you feel a little bit clever. I'm not sure that's totally ethical. <laughs> so your, a viewer would probably think, yeah, I can do these problems. That, you know, I, I'm as good, at least as good as those things, because you're actually seeing it before. And then you're seeing them struggle. But how is this uh, helping problem or illustrating problem solving? Oh, I, I didn't show that at all. <laughs> that's later. There's seven different stages of problem solving. And we go back and look at the people and how their, f their face is going like this and whatever and illustrate that people. So, so we did illustri illustrate those. I mean, that was those seven problem solving stages um, are the invention of, of the professor here, John Mason. Um, he's, he works in the psychology of mathematics. And um, so I'm not sure that that's a current theory, that those seven stages, but it's in the rest of, in the, rest of the program. Well, there's no, no time now left. There's only seven minutes left. I was going to show you some examples of um, language programs, which you two have seen a bit before, and that was going to illustrate some other points. But um, 
the paper that I said I was going to send you um, covers those same points. I could send it to other people because we haven't got time to actually look at the shots. So, or you could yeah, forward it. We can circulate it. Yeah. Circulate it, yes. So you were going to... So you were going to email me, and then I, I could, yes. right, and uh, well, the, so I was, it takes more than this um, the amount of time that we had to go through. But that was the last page that you've got there, which is shows what the structure of each of the language programs was about. They were always in that structure. Um, and um, what I was going to illustrate is that the structure itself follows table one and the techniques within each item also follow some of the things in table one. Um, and that will be in the paper anyway that, that I've published. Uh, sorry we didn't get on to the language one, but I'll send you the paper. Okay, thanks.